So John, it's wonderful to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Karen. It's, um, it's been a long time. It's been too long. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to be in conversation with you. Yeah, me too. Me too. We go way back and a lot of uh, what feels like really good karma. And uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you. And uh, you had made the suggestion that perhaps we might begin with some sitting. Shall we do that before we begin our conversation? Yeah, I think that's probably a, a, an appropriate thing to do so that we remind ourselves not to just fall into the head, so to speak. Uh, and hopefully that will be beneficial for anybody who's kind of going to eavesdrop on our conversation. Yes. However, it winds up being used at, uh, you know, mindfulness in America, I think. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just take a few moments and... Um, actually drop into silence and to whatever degree possible, a kind of embodied realization that we're already present and that it's possible to take up residence in this spaciousness of our awareness And nothing has to happen to fill the space. We can simply be fully present, attending, the actual unfolding of experience moment by moment, whatever that experience is, in addition to whatever you're hearing through the air waves and through the zoom waves of what I'm speaking that is coming to you. And just to remind ourselves or anybody who's uh, going to be hearing this that um, the awareness that we're experiencing by virtue of being here is coming to us through our various senses. But there's also a way in which awareness doesn't have to uh, have uh, objects of attention. It could be objectless or choiceless. And whatever arrives in the field of our awareness is met and seen and known without any disturbance. And therefore there's an intrinsic uh, clarity and equanimity associated with, as you put it, sitting, with just taking a moment to drop into being underneath all the, the you know, waves of thought on the ocean of the mind, at the surface of the ocean of the mind. And whether it's one in-breath and one out-breath or a half an in-breath, if that's all you allow yourself. Any inclination or gesture or move towards inhabiting the spaciousness of your own awareness, grounded in the body and 
the breath sensations in all the various sense doors and in awareness itself. Just know that this is all available to us literally 24-7 and certainly in all waking hours, as we say. And so the essence of any kind of meditative practice is not really striving to achieve some extra special end or state, but to actually realize how extra special this moment, this state, this um, constellation of emergence that is uh, our life while we have it to live. is ours, is already here. And is already, in some sense, good enough, a place to reside, a place that we can uh, inhabit, become more comfortable, and see and, and then act with greater clarity out of the deepest human elements of goodness that manifest uh, as you and as nobody else on this planet. And we all have our own unique but hugely overlapping constellations of love and beauty and clarity and kindness and intrinsic well-being, independent of circumstances. So I've used a lot of words, but that can actually just all happen in one and half an in-breath. Because when you let go of the words, then it's simply what is unfolding in this moment. And there's a lot of freedom in, in this. There's a lot of uh, liberative potential for us to get out of our own way, or another way to put it is find out what our true way might really be so that we can live in accordance with it while we're alive, while we have time. So, so let's just dive right into the conversation, affirming in some sense, if you don't mind my putting it this way, that the conversation itself will be part of the meditation, because ultimately, Life is the meditation practice. If you understand things this way, and there's something insanely, I think, not only beautiful, but infectious about that. And in the time when we're dealing with the infectivity of a really horrible and highly lethal for some people and highly communicable disease, epidemic, pandemic, uh, it's really important to remember that there are a lot of uh, positive ways in which we can help each other to, to transform that will ultimately um, transcend whatever our course is going to be with this virus before it is behind us. And use it as an opportunity for learning and for growing and, and in some ways for healing and, and for cultivating the kind of wisdom that I was trying to invite or suggest or point to in the guided uh, meditation. And I'll just point out, and I know you're going to revisit this or visit this theme, is that 
there is no end or beginning to meditation practice as uh, certainly my colleagues and I uh, see it. And, and so life really is the, the, the curriculum. Mm-hmm. Well, and years ago, John, you taught me that two things that at first didn't fit together and then you made them, you, you helped them fit together. Mm. And that, is that life is the meditation. And we have um, an endless number of moments in the course of the day to remind ourselves of where we are and to, to stop and reclaim, if you will, the present. And that's an opportunity that's available to us yeah. We think they're endless, but actually, yes. uh, as you as you originally were suggesting, I mean, you know, none of us are here forever. No, so no. those moments, no matter how many they are, they are in a day or in a moment. They're 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 extremely precious. They're, they're very precious, and, and in fact, we there's a, there's something about death that provides us an opportunity to realize that. That, that preciousness even more sweetly, and the um, and in a way, we're all terminal. Um, yeah, yeah. Some people happen to have a better sense of what they're likely to die from and when, and others of us don't have that sense. So there's, but the the urgency of the preciousness and the urgency of valuing these moments is um, is an opportunity that's available. But the, the two things that I was talking about earlier, so, so you, the, the concept of life as the meditation was, um, was a critical core component, I think, of your teaching and, and life. And yet the importance of a regular meditative practice yeah. with some discipline around that yeah. is also important. And... Um, and I think one of, I wanted to ask you to speak to how you see those integrating in a life. And if life is the meditation, why do we also have to sit on the cushion every morning? That's a phenomenal question. And, and it really, you know, moves to the, right into the this heart of the matter. Um, because it's hard for us to be fully present Mm -hmm. and not get caught in wanting things to be different or better. And I'm not saying things can't be different or better. I'm saying don't get caught in the wanting because then that will warp in some sense, potentially your ability to actually transform the world. So in some sense, the world itself and well-being and and morality depends on us knowing ourselves and being comfortable and not being driven by our basest or greediest or most acquisitive or um, um, impulses that that are really severely self-centered and sometimes really cause harm to other people unwittingly because We may not notice and we may not care. So there's, this is the paradox here. And it's, I love that because it's like, yeah, there's no place to go. There's nothing to do and there's nothing to attain. You can wake up in any moment, but the impulse to go back to sleep almost immediately, even if you wake up for a moment is so great that you have to exercise a certain kind of muscle. Although I don't want to, put too much weight on the exercise metaphor because people are so turned off by exercising, you know, uh, because it feels like it's slogging through mud. Mm -hmm. But there's a way to approach a meditation practice so that even though you align yourself with a kind of strong intentionality and a discipline, like you do it every day, the the kind of formal meditative practice where it's Whatever, and there are many different forms for it. So it's not just sitting meditation. But whatever it is, you commit to doing it every day as if your life depended on it. 
Now that's discipline and who wants more discipline in our lives, you know? We're already disciplined enough just getting food on the table for our kids and having to deal with like remembering to put on a mask and to social distance and all of this stuff. We're under so much stress that to ask us to actually now, now on top of all that, you want me to meditate and it's only the hardest work in the world. So the paradox is, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the hardest work in the world and it's no work at all. And you're already exactly where you need to be, but only if you can, in some sense, make room for that because it's so easy to zone along on autopilot for 10 or 20 or 30 years, being lost in thought, emotional reactivity, and striving to get to a place where you're going to ultimately be happy, whatever your fantasy of that would be. And then miss ironically miss the fact that this is it. And if you want to be happy, why not try being sort of at least in wise relationship to this moment as it is, and then be free of the conditions that, oh, if only this happened, then I'd be happy. But if this and this and this don't happen, then I'm, my life is screwed forever. Mm-hmm. And that's just thinking. But those, those kinds of thoughts create prisons for us. Now, why it takes like a whole lifetime in some sense to, I mean, I've been meditating for over 50 years and I feel like a rank beginner. I mean, it's it's just like a love affair that just keeps on um, opening new dimensions of experience and also slapping me straight in the face with how easy it is to fall into self-centered, fear-based stuff, especially... I mean, under any stressful conditions, that's true. But when you're dealing with a global pandemic and you don't even know how to relate to family that you can't get too close to or friends or whatever, um, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the love affair aspect of practice is that, well, what else is there to do? Because otherwise, sooner or later, we're going to wind up dying. And then maybe on our deathbed, realize we got the whole thing wrong we kind of thought that it was all about like getting somewhere where people would think we're smart or okay or whatever the stories are about successful wealthy i mean you know endless loved and that was some kind of idealization that actually eclipsed how beautiful you've always been. That maybe other people recognize more easily than you do. So this is not some sort of a narcissistic engagement where now I'm going to see how really beautiful I am. No, that's the, because that's the kind of imprisonment of the personal pronouns. But when we, when we allow ourselves to drop into awareness, there are no personal pronouns. Mm-hmm. There's only thinking. And we can see that that's like just weather patterns in the mind and they don't have to be taken personally. Then you're already free and that can happen like, as I was suggesting, half an in breath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then it helps if you take in the other half of the in breath too <laughs> and then let the out breath come out and see if you can string more than one or two moments of embodied wakefulness or mindfulness together and then begin to do that is kind of like more important than brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, personal hygiene, so to speak. I'm brushing my mind. The way you'd, I don't know what the right verb is because I'm not a horse person, but is it curry a horse or, you know, like you have the brush and you sort of go with the grain of the fur or whatever it is. Like you, you, in some sense, nurture your own capacity for being as opposed to being defined by what you do mm-hmm. or how you act. And then when the doing comes out of being, it's, you know, it's, it's a whole different doing because it's more authentic. It's more true to who you really are. That was a long-winded way of answering your question, but it's, it's that question. We could spend the whole time on it because it's like the tension between no time and all the time in the world. 
And that's the beauty of the present moment is that in some very real way, and we all know this, it's timeless. Mm -hmm. We often say time stood still, time stopped. Mm -hmm. Maybe just apprehending a sunset or, uh, you know, connecting with somebody you love. And for a moment, there was no time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, we all have that. We don't have to acquire it. We need to get out of the way so that we can inhabit that capacity that we're all pretty much born with. And the, until recently, now it's different, but you're not going to pick this up in school, even the most elementary elements of what a, a true mindfulness meditation practice would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I'm not I, even I, sure I answered your question, no, but at no, least you played with it a little bit. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I think the, you know, the, how the, discipline practice, if you will, and the posture through which you inhabit life, how those go together is something that, as you said, evolves over decades and the relationship between yeah. them and your attending to them deepens both and continues to feel new. And so I, I, I loved your, your thoughts. Yeah, and can I say that when I talk about discipline, I'm not kidding. I mean, you know, okay. I mean, for, for close to 50 years, I mean, I would wake up at four or five in the morning, depending on, you know, what was on the agenda for that day. I'd, I'd have to wake up really early mm -hmm. to get some time that was just for me. And I considered that to be more important than even sleep, although sleep is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. But wakefulness doesn't get even the amount of press that sleep gets. Mm -hmm. and everybody realizes you need nine, 10 hours of sleep or whatever it is. Uh, but we also need, but we don't have the research to prove it yet, we need awake time. And if you have to arrange the outer world so that you've got some awake time for yourself, and it means waking up at four or five in the morning, I, I did that for 50 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit, bit more fluid about it now because after a while, the convergence between formal meditation, it's not like I would give it up at all, but the convergence is such that, you know, I, I don't have to maintain that rigid a kind of discipline that identifies me as one of those people who just gets up an hour before I would normally get up so that I have time to get my body down on the floor and practice mindful hatha yoga, and then I, I sit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I and I loved your description of the care for the horse because the motion you made was this petting motion. And it reminded me, you talked about kind of brushing our mind, but what I was visualizing as you were using your hands was this like whole petting of the inside of your body, like this whole, mm -hmm. but it was a very loving gesture. So it's not. Oh, well, thanks for uh, noticing that. Loving. I didn't. It's not a hard scrubbing. No, no, no. It's not beating yourself up so that you'll be better at some point or even right. look better or look like a good meditator or anything. Because as soon as you sit down, I, and I'll just say this, just, but then let's pursue the conversation. But as soon as you sit down, the first thing, whether you've been meditating for decades or whether you're brand new to it, the first thing is like, well, when's what's supposed to happen going to happen? You know, I mean, is this it? Is this all? I mean, like, this is boring. I mean, it'd be better. I'd be better off sleeping. Or I'm not comfortable. My body hurts. Mm -hmm. Or my mind hurts. Or I'm falling into anxiety. Or I'm going through my to-do list. Or, is it, that's the whole point in the discipline, is to, like, see it and realize that that's what your mind does. That's what all of our minds do. They fill up the space of awareness with stuff, with reactivity, thoughts, emotions, and so forth. And then the awareness just gets eclipsed, mm -hmm. gets obscured by the cloudiness of our own turgid, you know, stuff. Even if it's beautiful stuff, it's still stuff. And so we lose out on this extra dimension that could actually 
provide a whole other way of being in wise relationship with life unfolding, including now we know enough about the science of this, profound health effects on a lot of different levels. Profound health effects. The ultimate health effect being that you're happy, that you're living the life that's yours to live. And it doesn't necessarily mean the conditions have to be great for you to be happy mm -hmm. because we'll never constantly be, because things change. So we'll never constantly be able to hold it. Okay, I'm happy now, let's just hold it like this because I can't handle anything that would cause this to change well. The only thing that you can actually hang your hat on is that everything's going to change whether you like it or not. So that's self a liberative moment to realize that I don't have to take responsibility for all that. All I have to do is find a new way to be in wise relationship to it. And that's what the discipline is involved. And I'd say for the first 20 or 30 years, maybe we have the conceit, I'm meditating. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like, I'm, I'm meditating. Now I'm going to sit down. Now I'm going to be meditating. After 30 or 40 years, it feels more like the meditation is doing me more than I'm doing the meditation. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, as you were saying, it's life that's in some sense doing all of us. And it is so amazing that it would be really sad if we missed the entire thing. And then as Thoreau observed a long time ago in Walden, just before we died, realized that we hadn't lived at all. Well, and one of the things that um, you pointed out to me in an interview that we had years and years ago was the one of the reasons to practice on a regular basis and to attend to how you bring yourself back is is to prepare for those times of absolute horror or unanticipated change it's 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 not that hard to be present when things are going swimmingly yeah but to build the, the capacity or at least think you are <laughs> right fair enough or but to build the capacity or the capability to be able to dig deep within yourself when you really need to you know, yeah that's beautiful. yeah well, Let's talk a little bit about how you've spent these last several months, John, because um, these have been extraordinary in so many unanticipated, in unanticipated ways. Talk about change that none of us would have predicted. Yeah. Um, we're in the, in the midst of you know, multiple crises uh, as, a, as a people, as a planet, as a country. And one of the things that you did was um, lead the mitigation retreat. You led this retreat for 13 weeks. And Monday through Friday, day in and day out, led a meditation and then took live questions from um, the thousand people who were live with you on Zoom. And, I, and you know you were accompanied by um, thousands and thousands more who were joining you live on YouTube or later on YouTube, some of whom are doing that now. And I'm curious for you, um, what, what, I guess what, I'm, what I wanna start with, John, is how have you changed through this six months? What was the impact on you of going through this process where at the beginning, you certainly had no idea of what you were committing to? Um, and yet you, I want to start and just ask you your sense of your own evolution. Um, but then I want to come to the community and how you saw that evolve and, and, and the impact on others. What touched me most about the retreat was that anybody showed up for it. Um, there was a lot of talk in mid-March. I mean, when things started shutting down, all the universities shut down, uh, you know, the unemployment, <clears throat> I mean, the job loss was like millions every week, up to 40 million. And that was all like um, the last social event I had in, <laughs> with real people was the last weekend in February. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had some visitors to our home uh, right after that, family. 
and then everything shut down. And we could still be in relationship to uh, the pod that was our family, you know, that my grandchildren and my daughter who live near, nearby, right around the corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but aside from that, it was like hermetically sealed. We we're supposed to lower, flatten the curve, right? We were all supposed to actually engage as an act of compassion, not get, go out unless you were a frontline worker or an essential worker who is involved in, you know, in some sense or other, feeding all of us millions of people, mm-hmm. feeding millions of people who are out of work and a living paycheck by che- pay- paycheck to paycheck, uh, and all the people who are dying from an illness that we rapidly got, it rapidly got on top of us instead of us being on top of it for all sorts of reasons that start with the, you know, dismantling the uh, pandemic preparedness teams uh, on the national level and defunding them, including Mm -hmm. the CDC. And, you know, so like we, uh, but the expectation in towards the middle of March when Soren and I started talking about like, what what could we do? Mm -hmm. Um, So the, the, the mitigation retreat started in the last week of March, and it started with a, uh, an hour and a half talk that I gave. <coughs> Excuse me. And I just felt like I wanted to just reach out to whoever was interested in dialoguing, although it's all like one way, you know, in a certain way, at least while I'm talking, but to reach out to people and remind them that if we had to actually socially isolate, which is the phrase that was being used, lock ourselves up in our homes and figure out how to get food, but aside from that, like no contact. Well, we know how to do that. Meditators know how to do that Mm -hmm. because we have been spending decades going places where we do just that. We shut down. Mm -hmm. They feed us a couple of meals a day. And aside from that, all we're doing is sitting and walking and almost all of it, 99% of it in silence. Mm -hmm. So when you live inside that kind of container, and you could call it a pressure cooker to some degree or other, on heavy duty silent retreats, you learn stuff about being and being present that are akin to what we were talking about before. And while that might seem like idiotic or a total luxury for people when there's no pandemic and uh, there's no uh, order to stay at home, if 300 million people are basically told to stay at home, you could maybe use a little support and how to handle this in a way that actually makes you feel like you can, you can do this. I can do this. I can engage. And, I can, and it can be benefits Broadly speaking, to both myself and to the community, much larger, if we engage in this kind of way. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's not just sitting in silence. So it wasn't just leading guided meditations, which I did, as you said, every Monday through Friday for 13 straight weeks. But but it was also a conversation. Mm-hmm. And I love the gallery view because it allowed us to see, although there were so many pages, you couldn't scroll through the gallery and it often crashed the system. Mm-hmm. But that there were so many people that, were gonna, that would show up in real time first to listen to that talk with which uh, on March 25th, I think it was, you know, so Sora and I just like put it out there and uh, 24, 400 people listened live wow. from every time zone in the world. So once I did that, it was obvious like, well, you can't stop now. Mm-hmm. You have to actually drop. Instead of stop, drop mm-hmm. in. So let's provide kind of container for at least one hour a day and two days a week. It'll be two hours a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we'll have small groups so people can support each other and have conversation where we actually practice together. In whatever ways we can do in a limited fashion online. So it's not like we're all in the same room, but on a retreat, 
I mean, the largest retreats I've led are for three or 400 people. And usually they're more for like 200 people mm -hmm. in a room, in a place, if anybody even remembers that we used to do that kind of thing. But now we're in this room called Zoom and the number of people who can participate and really tune into what is being pointed to through the words and through our gestures and connections, it's limitless. Mm -hmm. So that I see as a kind of love affair with our potential as a species to grow into awareness, which is the fundamental meaning of the Latin name Linnaeus gave us, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, a species that is aware and is aware that it's aware. So that's what's called technically awareness and meta-awareness. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we don't learn in school until recently, now it's being taught in schools more and more. So it felt like, let's do this and let's have conversation, dialogue, inquiry about what we're really doing. So it's not just some kind of mechanical, breathe in, breathe out, relax, let go, blah, 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 you know, the sort of ways in which this kind of stuff can turn to, you know what I mean, in your mouth, if you, you know, because it is so easily um, trivialized when actually it's the most important thing for us humans in the world. Oh, breath, I'm not, even if you do it at the level of the breath, I'm not that interested in the breath. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're only one breath away from being dead at any given moment. So if you can't take this breath in, you know, it doesn't take more than a fraction of a second for that, no matter what's going on in your mind, no matter what's going on with your work, uh, no matter what's going on with the pandemic, all of that exits within a fraction of a second when you can't take the next in breath. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's important to you is this new, new getting this in breath. Mm -hmm. So why do we trivialize it so much? Even at that level, but there are so many other levels in which when we find an object of attention and we ride on the waves, say, of the breathing, it's not about the breathing, it's about the attending. And so we dialogue around it in the questions and answers uh, because it's so beautiful that people bring what's on their minds into the question and then I have an opportunity to at least like a mirror perhaps reflect back how that could be held slightly differently if you embraced it in awareness kind of as a love affair rather than reject it if you don't like it or be seduced by it if it's a kind of something that you really uh, that really uh, floats your boat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how it um, you know arose and 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 just to say the dialogue was extremely rich from my point of view. The, the comments, it wasn't just questions and answers. It's like inquiry together. What is this all about? And people bring their stress, their pain, their illness, their anguish. Uh, it was during the time of, you know, sort of um, all this social upheaval, racial violence in the streets. Uh, and all of this became part of the curriculum and we got a chance to talk about it in ways that actually emphasize that mindfulness is not about just some nice thing to quiet your mind, but if you are uh, awake, you have to be awake to human injustice. You have to be awake to not just personal human injustice, but institutionalized mm -hmm. racism, institutionalized injustice. And that means, oh, I didn't realize the mind has to be that big. Well, it already is. But the question is, how do you hold it without going crazy? And that's what the, where the rubber meets the road in terms of the Q&A. Yeah. And of course, I'm not like a fountain of wisdom. So it's more like we're dialoguing and inquiring together about, well, how could we use the meditation practice to hold this in ways that uh, might um, provide some kind of clarity, some kind of solace, some kind of enduring um, affirmation of uh, beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we take it back into the meditation practice and the next day there's more of it. And the next day there's more of it. And people got time off on the weekend because 
it just seemed like it would be too intense to just have it be seven days a week for me personally in my life, but also for everybody. We need like some time for like uh, metabolizing, metabolizing mm -hmm. what's been felt or hear or heard. One of the things that I observed in the questions and I'm curious and comments, I'm curious if you felt this was that at the beginning, it was very much about the pandemic and the consequences of that for people individually, the fears around that individually, sometimes the anger around yeah. that as people were approaching it differently. But over the 13 weeks, it seemed to, to me as an observer that the dialogue shifted to expand to include just all of life, whatever was happening around the globe as you had participants from all over the, the world. And people were bringing to you, in, often in the form of a question, um, but sometimes a comment, um, the deeper, really true life questions. Yeah. And, and maybe that's part of just people adjusting into the pandemic, but it also seemed to me that there was a, a deepening of the of the dialogue over the course of time and a familiarity in the, in amazingly in a community of a live of a thousand people yeah. I'm, but i'm curious how you saw that whether you felt that evolution or um or a different evolution during those weeks You know, it was a global event. I mean, people were tuning in from everywhere, but I, I, I'm in Massachusetts and acutely aware that uh, the pandemic is being handled very differently in different places. Mm -hmm. So in Europe, they really got a handle on it in China and Korea and Taiwan. I mean, they really got a handle on it. And we are doing this pandemic, you know, this sort of mitigation retreat, only nothing's mitigating. We're looking at the curves and America is just getting worse and worse and worse because we didn't have the, the sort of uh, leadership that accorded the science and the public health and the epidemiology and the experts the power to actually uh, bring together all of the different 50 states and that leadership in a way that supported everybody with whatever they needed from personal protective equipment to, you know, ventilators or whatever it was. So, so as the retreat progressed, the expectation was that like it was going to naturally come to an end because they said it would all be over, you know, in three months. Right. And the retreat was like a three month retreat. But by the time it got like into the, even a couple of weeks, it was like, we're not doing this right at all. I mean, we're just making a mess of it. The amount of death and illness and, you know, and, and uh, unemployment and suffering and, and food lines and everything else. I mean, it's like humiliating for a country that touts itself as like, you know, uh, the incarnation of uh, freedom and, liberty and you know economic uh you know so opportunity and so forth and we have 40 million people out of work and no leadership i mean it's just like um so the shift it wasn't any kind of conscious thing but if you detected a shift and i'm not sure i'd have to go back and look at all 13 weeks of it but i think there was a general sense that we got more into the practice mm -hmm. and the practice is without expectation so even the expectation that, oh, this is going to be over, that the, we're going to flatten the curve and then everything's going to be great. And then we, uh, none of that was happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the United States, but it was happening in many of the countries that other people were listening to. So my challenge was in some sense to hold the whole planet mm -hmm. and not just be U.S. centric to the point. And I tried to do that as much as possible because of all of the insanity that was going on in those three months mm -hmm. and the murders, you know, by the police and uh, of people of color and, you know, videotaped and, you know, like George Floyd and, and then the funerals and the marches and then, and then the, you know, Trump trying to cross the street and, you know, just uh, uh, for a photo op and, and beating the crap out of all, all those protesters. And then now it's Black Lives Plaza 
uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C., because the mayor asserted her prerogative, but she couldn't do it in the face of Trump because she doesn't have any control over the White House. Or the... Yeah. So that background made it feel more and more to me that we need to go, as usual, with um, the practice itself and not try to project what the outcome of any of this is going to be. This is the full catastrophe of the human condition, of the human mind, of the present moment, and it's different in every country. And so, but the practice doesn't matter which country you're in because uh, whatever arises, that becomes the curriculum. So if you're in the Philippines or if you're in South Korea, you have a different curriculum, but you have the same framework for approaching whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's more happiness and less grief, but all the same, um, things being impermanent, we're learning how to handle happiness, grief, and everything in between. And then that's, that's wisdom. Mm-hmm. Well, and in a sense, to have that diversity of experience happening concurrently while you were, is a perfect opportunity. And everybody felt it. And yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, my birthday happened towards the end of it. And, um, and I got wind through Sarin that, you know, nowadays, like all they have to do is Google you and they know when, when you were born. So it was, I saw this coming there. I wasn't going to be able to, what I usually do is just like ignore it completely because I'm not that into my own birthday. But I approached it with a certain degree of like diffidence or trepidation. But then what emerged actually was like teams of people got together from around the world. They developed a website uh, called the Map of Love. And then everybody contributed to it. And then all sorts of, you know, um, social media things arose around it. And people connecting with each other around the world Mm -hmm. and making friends with each other at a time when we can't leave our house. So there was something about that that was really an eye-opener for me. And I realized, like, this is not really about my birthday. This is just an excuse for them to, in some sense, uh, give back, but also to share the profundity of what they'd already experienced. And what's on that website is profound, Mm -hmm. including all the birthday cards and wishes. And, you know, somebody even found, and I don't know, I'm not technologically savvy enough to do this, but somebody actually went back to the original movie of Zorba the Greek and clipped out the section where he talks about dancing and uh, in the face of the full catastrophe and put that in the middle of a card as a video card. And it was like, unbelievable. I mean, there's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of imagination out there. And I think people felt like we're a real community. We're a real community. I'll also say that there were a few people that abused it and we ran into certain kinds of things on social media, the people who organized this, that this is one of the shadows of social media. It's not a shadow anymore. It's more, more the, the thing itself than the shadow. The shadow is bigger than the thing itself. But a small number of people can be extremely disruptive of large intentionality to do good. And we have to learn uh, how to... Um, in some sense, develop uh, immunity, (laughs) an immune system to recognize and handle those kinds of things so that they don't subvert the 99.9%, you know, intentionality for uh, caring. Mm -hmm. That's not about exploiting people's pain for my own benefit. And some people were trying to do that in one way or another, whether it's, you know, shopping their wares or, or just taking advantage of people or, or even predation, mm-hmm. you know, and those are coming to some of the, the dangers of being on the internet. But for the most part, that all happened after the retreat was over, but for the most part, and it's got taken care of as far as I uh, know, but for the most, I mean, it was an extraordinary outpouring and is ongoing as far as I know. I also think it was good that Soren and I ended it, that there was a point that we needed to 
at least for that moment, mm -hmm. end it and see what would unfold without this and trust that we just keep up the meditation practice ourselves. And so we're shifting from the, intra, the, the internet or Zoom to Indra's net, which I talked about a number of times during the retreat, which is where, hey, we're all connected anyway by, being virt by virtue of being human. And so when you take your seat at any given moment in time, there are millions of people who are meditating just like you are. Can you actually tune into being whole yourself and part of a larger whole? And my hope is that that was one of the outcomes of the mitigation retreat, whatever country people were in, right. and that the practice is really for life. Mm -hmm. And it is a love affair. The of the community. The... Yeah. Um, so I want to come back to something that you mentioned, because as you said, during the mitigation retreat, um, of course, unforeseen, became this extraordinary time of racial justice, civil unrest, protests, um, death. And I'm curious about how you, and, and you made a great deal of space for the importance of activism and outrage in, in the mitigation retreat and in life. And I, I'm curious how for you, you, you find the balance between the, the outrage, the action or activism and the regular practice of bringing yourself present and how do you hold um how do you hold the those together well for people who, who know me um my political activism goes back to uh, when i was a graduate student at mit during the vietnam war so it, it goes back to 1965 at least or antedates that i mean 1960 three actually i mean i went on my first anti-war uh, demonstration in new york city i think the first anti-war demonstration against the vietnam war in may of 1964 and i knew the person who had organized it because he was actually a sophomore at the college that i was going to but and he he got bertram russell to connect with him and together they put on this first so and then there was the civil rights before that, so the, the you know, so an interesting thing, um, and MIT, where I was a graduate student, was involved in developing all the laser-guided smart weapons and nuclear missile guidance systems that can, you know, basically put a nuclear bomb down a chimney half a half the world away. I knew the people who developed those guidance systems and the weapons. And so this has been a part of my life from really very early on to actually include that in the actuality of taking our seat and apprehending the totality of what's going on because it's all about suffering. And suffering, those are forms of suffering. Creating weapons of mass destruction is a form of delusion. It's a form of suffering. It's like, I know if we don't do it, they do it. Then, you know, we got to at least, you know, have nuclear deterrence and all of that stuff. But the amount of uh, pain and suffering associated with that is, is enduring. And what's lost in terms of revenue that could be spent educating children, building new hospitals, taking care of uh, poverty once and for all in the society, eliminating racism. So it's, it's always been this way. You know, there's always been injustice. Slavery goes back 400 years. And then there's the genocide before that. So this has always been, so people don't know this, although I've written about it a little bit, but MBSR was actually an outgrowth of something that uh, one of the faculty members at MIT said about us activist students complaining, uh, why don't you ever do anything creative? All you want to do is destroy what we've done. Because mm -hmm. they were worried we were going to burn down the place. Mm -hmm. And believe me, there were people was, at MIT that were, were prepared to burn down the place, mm -hmm. which didn't seem like that was such a sensible thing to do. Because it, um, So I started actually meditating on what 
what I could do to respond to that. Like, and MBSR was the outcome of that. You know, to do something that would uh, be an offering to the world that would actually move the bell curve of humanity. And public health was the place I decided to start in medicine, okay? Can we take people falling through the cracks of the healthcare system and challenge them to do something for themselves that their doctor and no one else on the planet can do for them and move towards greater levels of health and well-being? And we'll research it to make sure that it's not just blah, 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 but we're actually testing it and seeing whether it does influence mental health, physical health, social health. And that was 40 plus years ago. And it does. We have enough science to be able to assert that quite effectively. Uh, and, and it's still in its infancy. So there was never any separation between the activist John Kabat-Zinn and the meditator John Kabat-Zinn. There, there never was. And I've experienced some pretty intense moments of like, you know, encountering the police myself. I mean, I got the crap beat out of me. Anybody who wants to research it can find it in the newspapers. So including in the UK not that long ago. So I'm not like focusing on this, but, you know, in the Cambridge police station in the back room, I mean, they just beat the living daylights out of me to the point where I had to pretend to lose consciousness because I realized they were, they were actually going to kill me. So I had, even though I'm a nice white, you know, boy from MIT, I mean, it didn't matter once they got triggered. And, um, and um, I realized that kind of the police brutality it's unimaginable for people who don't have any privilege. I saw that because I had like all this privilege. I mean, like Cambridge police know not to beat up MIT students, but because it was the Cambodian invasion, the Vietnam War and all this stuff, it got kind of, you know, uh, smeared, you know, a little bit mixed up. But for people who don't have that kind of white skin privilege or, you know, uh, the support of educational institutions or family or anything like that. So you know, the fact that now that's back after the 60s, after the violence of the 60s and, you know, the murder of Martin Luther King and all of this stuff where they were, you know, the, the you know, cities were being burned down. And now all of a sudden it's back in a way that, is so much more distributive across the population that, you know, white people are not going to stand for this anymore. Moms against violence, you know, in places like Portland, you know, and, and you see the sort of fascistic kinds of, you know, things that the state are trying to do. It's like, that's in the United States of America today. And the jury is still out about how this is going to all unfold between now and November. So, there's no separation between meditative awareness, clarity, compassion, kindness, and uh, caring for people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. And the root causes of institutionalized uh, pain and suffering are colossal. Corporate greed, you know, you can't get justice often but corporations can get more justice because they treat it as if they have human rights. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's a corporation. It's like a stuff on paper. And the humans, they, they're murdered if they don't have, you know, uh, if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. or look the wrong way at somebody or whatever it is, or have a headlight out or, you know, I mean, it's all cliched, but it's not cliche when it's happening to you yeah. and it's happening in, and it's always happened. It's not new, only it, it may be it's new for white people in a certain way. Well, that would be mindfulness. Yeah. Hey, you woke up to the fact that, Hey, people are being murdered and you don't know anything about it because it doesn't bother, doesn't concern me. So, what kind of mindfulness would that be? What kind of heartfulness or compassion would that be if it's just all about more for me and whatever else is happening doesn't concern me? That's a very small me. 
And so the point of the meditation is like, let's look at who me is and who's looking at the who me is. Mm -hmm. And is the whoever's looking at the who me is, that me? Or is it a much larger me? Or is it even a we? Is it like some kind of core hum human function that we actually share because we're totally interconnected, totally interconnected? So those are some of the kinds of um, threads that uh, manage to, you know, sort of um, inform how I saw the retreat, the mitigation retreat. Um, I didn't actually mean to go into all that detail about the, my own political activism and experience of that, except to say that it's been there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think it's avoidable because if you turn away from suffering, institutionalized, systematic suffering, and you're thinking, oh, I'll just be in some kind of enlightened bliss state, the enlightened bliss state you are in is one of total delusion. Delusion, right, right. So that, and that's interesting, John, because you did step fully into, you didn't just acknowledge, but you stepped fully into what was happening in the world and in your heart. And, um, and that's the practice, is to, be, is to be fully in it. I was struck... Um, I was struck in listening to you respond to people is when they would describe their pain, what their, their suffering, um, whether it was physical or fear or connected to the um, deep, deep pain in, in our country, um, as we've been just discussing, you, your, your posture in response was extraordinarily empathetic. But I literally never heard you say, I'm sorry you're going through that, or that's too bad that you're going through that, or wow, what a shame that you're experiencing, you know, that so-and-so died or that you have this physical ailment. There's something um, that I began to notice about how you approach suffering with what I, and I'm curious whether my interpretation is correct because it was with this extraordinary empathy, but also acceptance and assumption that of course there's suffering. So the question, it isn't about um, the suffering being the exception and something to acknowledge or be sorry for or try to treat as, a, as an oddity, but rather the suffering as, so you're living and let me meet you in your life and try to hear you. And it, it really struck me over time because I found myself sometimes hearing people and wanting to say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry you lost this person that you love or that this. Mm -hmm. And then after watching you, I thought, this is very informative about how, how, how we can accept suffering with empathy. So there's nothing hard about it. Um, and yet um, not be surprised by it. And in fact, move with it. Does that make sense, what I'm describing? Uh, I'm actually very moved uh, to even hear you say that, because that's kind of a real feedback that I'm not aware of. I mean, it's just the way I am. Um, but I do have opinions about when we get uncomfortable about other people's suffer suffering and then platitudes come out of mm -hmm. our mouths to try to there, there, make it better for the other person or whatever. And it's, it's often comes from a very um, sincere place. Mm -hmm. But it, it emphasizes, it has a certain element of pity associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a vast difference between compassion and pity. So pity is a certain kind of othering mm -hmm. where it's like uh, you're over there and I'm sorry for your loss. Mm -hmm. If you're really sorry for the person's loss, maybe you don't need to say anything. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's your being that does all the talking. 
Maybe it's the silent presence that does all the talking. Now, I'm saying this maybe because I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think like, oh, now, how should I answer this question so that it will look compassionate? <laughs> I mean, that would be absurd. Mm -hmm. Also, take too much time, you know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> and you'd have to think and thinking is slow. I mean, and everybody would feel like this is a canned response. He says that he says that whenever he feels uncomfortable to hide his own discomfort or to just there, there, make at least acknowledge the other person. Maybe the, the way to really acknowledge what someone's saying and again, I'm not telling you this as some kind of planned out thing, but more just from your question and observation to just really listen, to really listen. And then you hear it, and then you respond however you do. And you don't respond out of some kind of contrived thought process mm -hmm. that's going to, in some sense, try to make it better. Mm -hmm. Because the meditation practice is not about making it better. Healing is not fixing. It's not going back to the way things were before the thing happened. Mm -hmm. Healing is a coming to terms with the actuality of things as they are. Mm -hmm. a coming to terms, mm -hmm. in some sense, coming to peace. And it's a timeless and... and, uh, and, and uh, and time-bound process at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they say time heals all wounds, but at the cert at, at also, in no time, if you feel seen or heard or met in your suffering, then you can see, hear, or feel yourself and meet yourself in your suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's already healing in, the, in that moment because it's... It's holding it as it is without trying to make it better. And this is all like an infinite number of words to say something about what you were observing that basically happened very quickly. Mm -hmm. But this is new for me. I mean, I've, nobody has ever observed that and asked me that kind of question. So I'm trying to give it... Uh, you know, some deep reflection in terms of what, because I think I know what, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad to hear it too, because um, anything other than that would be kind of um, fake, a sham, a performance. And you can't possibly be prepared to take, you know, questions from a thousand people. And there's no... Well, no, <laughs> I, I would argue with that. You have... <laughs> the, the, the preparing is not what you... Is not thinking. Right. And, and in, so in a sense... The whole I mean, life is preparation like, for that kind you, of thing. You know, you're right. Absolutely. And, and what you were modeling, I think, for us is that one of the words you use is you're you're thinking this through is listening and is um, showing up wholly in the imperfection, you know, the, the reality of life. Yeah. The and, basic schlep that I am, you know, well, just, I, I wouldn't say modeling either I, I, because modeling in, in the clinical psychological world uh, where I sometimes visit uh, is kind of like implies that, you fake it a little bit. Ah, ah. You pretend that you're a compassionate person until maybe you do become a compassionate person. In my and world, it's teaching. It's, it's what you were <laughs> saying within your question. Yeah. Uh, whereas if what you're saying is that you saw something embodied, yes. maybe not, you didn't even see it, you felt it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe you felt it in its absence, that it was the, what you felt was that I wasn't doing something conventional to there, there, make it better, or, you know, uh, but that you felt something. So that's, that's powerful. And then it goes beyond words. That becomes a certain kind of poetry, mm -hmm. the poetry of relationality, the uniqueness of 
whatever is arising in a question mm -hmm. from somebody who I will never know. So it's the, the whole universe is in that question. And of course, whatever response I have to it, I will never know. It's not coming out of thought. I could probably have a hundred responses, but what, because it's not coming out of thought, the only response I get is the one that I give that I'm not entirely responsible for because it's not coming out of some kind of strategizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like I'm learning something from this conversation in, in a kind of way that I realize this is being filmed and people are gonna talk to us about this, but I feel like we're having an authentic conversation. I'm getting a little visitor. <gasps> talk about authentic oh, conversation. Dear, sweetie. Hello. Welcome. Oh, yes. What? My goodness, that's a very that's big leap. Yeah, you, you want me to take him down? It's okay. I mean, uh, how about in five minutes, okay? If you want. Yeah, would that work? Or? Absolutely. Okay. So, what's this? So, uh, this is Karen, okay? She's an old friend of mine. Yeah. And we're having a conversation. Do you want to sit here for a few minutes and listen to us? Yeah. Or do you want to just go downstairs and be with your mom and Nona? You want to stay here? Okay, so you just have to watch, okay? What's your name? Can you tell Karen what your name is? Oh. Okay, I'll t I, his name is Joaquin. Joaquin. Uh, or Kimi. Kimi, and did you have fun at the beach? Yeah. Can we play in the water? So um, that's, I think, that in some sense is the poetry of um, the practice, mm -hmm. is that it's when you drop underneath thought, it's not like you get stupid or something like that, or you can't think about things, mm -hmm. but that you're tapping a different form of intelligence, which is called awareness. It's not something we... It doesn't have a special name, but it's insanely special. Mm -hmm. And when it's embodied, then it's, it's not different from compassion. It's 100% it's congruent with compassion. They are, they, they are the one and the same. Mm -hmm. it's, feel, it's wakefulness. I mean, we don't, and then it goes beyond words. That's why the poetry is so important. I'll come down a little bit. Okay, shall I give you back to Mama? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's let me let me do that. I will be back in one minute. Okay. He may have regretted his decision once you handed him off. Well, um, I think he's just absolutely one hundred percent fine with whatever unfolds. And uh, it's a little bit hard for an almost two-year-old to wrap uh, his mind around what the hell this is even. Um, but uh, he doesn't need to because he's like fully present yeah. Yeah. himself. So um, I'm, I'm open to keeping going for a little bit longer. I know you have other questions, and I know Soren doesn't care what the length of the question is. <laughs> uh, it's all just a question of whether it's of some use. Well, let uh, me ask you about another dimension of this, John. I'm curious. Now you've, for six months, you've been teaching exclusively, um, teaching and connecting with people exclusively over video conference, Zoom or other platforms. And that's obviously a massive shift in how you have been teaching and I'm, I'm curious how uh, let's assume that the pandemic is managed that a vaccine emerges and that the possibility of of teaching as you did emerges how will your teaching and your thinking about connecting with con this community with with any community evolve in the in the years to come based on what you've experienced these six months? I have no idea. And I love that. Uh, and none of us have any idea what 
post-COVID-19 is going to be like. But one of the themes of the retreat that kept on visiting us over and over again is uh, we're not going back into the same world and pretend this didn't happen and they just get back to normal. There is no more normal. There won't even be a new normal. We got climate change bearing down on us. I mean, even if we didn't have the pandemic and there will be more pandemics. I mean, this is a wake up call for humanity. So I love that I don't actually know, and I'm not going to give you a kind of, uh, you know, sort of dime story answer to, to that question, because it's the not knowing that is kind of the heart of the meditation practice, mm -hmm. the willingness to just kind of rest in awareness and be the knowing and the not knowing. So that's another reason to not have continued the, the mitigation retreat beyond 13 weeks, that there's like... Uh, don't know what's going to happen now, but I needed to give extended period of time to my family without, you know, sort of uh, other kinds of things to whatever degree that was possible mm -hmm. in these kinds of conditions that are going on much longer than any of us thought they would in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, To go back to the Indra's net image. Okay. Zoom, the internet has given us something. Imagine we didn't have it and there was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Ew, what, what would that have been like? So we actually have migrated into a kind of digital universe that has a reach that was inconceivable like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. If the pandemic had hit, you know, the 1918 influenza, right. Spanish flu, uh, so-called, uh, there was none, no internet, barely telephone. Mm -hmm. And now here we are in some kind of interconnected alternate universe. And so we're at this uh, interface, we've always been there, but this helped us w wake up to it between the analog and the digital world. And if you read uh, Yuval Noah Harari, Sapiens and Homo Deus, and then 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, I mean, the technology and the science and the bioscience is bearing down on all sorts of elements that were inconceivable 50 years ago, but that may wind up transforming what we mean by being human and how we actually influence our own everything. I don't even want to go into the nightmare scenarios. Even the happiest nightmare scenarios are nightmare scenarios. And so for me, the aspiration, the hope, maybe it's totally deluded, is that before we give up being homo sapiens sapiens, before we give up our analog humanity, we learn to inhabit fully our analog humanity and know the full range and extent of it, mm -hmm. okay? Including what awareness is, what compassion is, how they function in a social network that is global and where photos from satellites of the melting glaciers, for instance, why is that not as much an object of attention in mindfulness practice and the disappearance of the glaciers over time or ice cores from Antarctica and all of this kind of stuff? That's as much a valid meditative, in fact, more necessary than our own breath. Because if the, if the atmosphere changes, uh, we're not going to have a breath. There won't be a homo sapiens. The cockroaches will continue to do just fine. Other things will evolve on this planet. Maybe, you know, machines will evolve on this planet. I mean, who knows? But if we care about who we are or what we have or however you want to frame it, then now is the moment. And so pandemic, post-pandemic, whatever, this is, uh, 
a priceless moment for us. And as everybody says, it's a giant cliche, an inflection point. May it be an inflection point in the direction of sanity, in the direction of love, in the direction of compassion, in the direction of uh, eradicating global poverty Mm -hmm. at every level Mm -hmm. and eradicating barriers to privilege at every level. We're all privileged, originally privileged, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We're privileged to breathe the same air. It doesn't matter, like, you know, you you be a gazillionaire. Uh, You don't have special air to breathe. Uh, That may be coming too, you know, bottled tanks of air, you know, because you can't breathe the air anymore. The nightmare scenarios, the dystopias are like unbelievable, but this is our, this is it. This is our opportunity. Uh, And that's why I've been doing what I've been doing for the past 50, 60 years, Uh, because I I really want to tilt things in the direction of sanity, in the direction of wakefulness, in the direction of love, and and ultimately in the direction of wisdom, okay? Uh, And the wisdom that minimizes our impulses to harm each other, and we all have them, Mm -hmm. (coughs) and protect ourselves and sort of encased in ego and violence, sometimes oriented towards others, or fraud or whatever it is that... Um, and so to minimize those human, very human impulses in ourselves, not just in other people that we project them out onto, and maximize how much your mother loved you when you were born, okay? That you, that you still are. And the potential of that, or, and nurture that, because it, it evolves, it grows, it matures, it, it, and into what? We don't know. When, when humans are really met and nurtured in that kind of a way, body, mind, heart, whatever language you want to use, uh, so that they are given permission to be free and help to be who they are and what they intuitively want to pursue. Um, I think that's how we reclaim or live our way into, for the first time, Homo sapiens sapiens, the species name. And I'm glad I'm still on the planet for this adventure. And I'm glad other people care. I mean, I think this is part of, I mean, Soren's never all that clear about how these things are going to be used. But I think this is part of some kind of online mindfulness in America thing, because we can't do this, uh, you know, together the way we've always been doing. So if that's true, I mean, the idea that there would be a mindfulness in America thing online or in person in New York City uh, 40 or 50 years ago is like laughable. Mm -hmm. And even though there's a lot of hype and uh, stupidity being associated with mindfulness, uh, the essence of it is something that will take us thousands of years to grow into but it's on the right path. And that's why I want to, you know, sort of move it more and more in that direction. So to answer your question, I don't think, you know, no matter how big a retreat I would lead in person, and I do, the retreats that I had to cancel in Europe and in the United States and in China and other places for 2020, they'll happen in 2021, or if not in 2021, 2022, as long as I keep breathing. Uh, but how big can the you know, stadium be for that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. And what would it look like if it was in a stadium? I mean, it's like we're in a stadium. We're in a, a global space that's infinitely bigger than a stadium. The important thing is not the venue. The important thing is the love. And the commitment to come back to what you were, we talked about earlier, the discipline. This is, the, this is the hardest work in the world for us humans. It's not like, oh, just be mindful. You know, by the time the next outbreath happens, you will do something to get in your own way and not be mindful. So this is really, really hard work. And we do have to exercise that muscle. And we have to work with the resistance and the suffering and the karma that is ours. Often we don't ask for it. You know, I mean, often it's horrific and often... Uh, it is uh, weighted towards the people who uh, 
far from being privileged, are absolutely, you know, targeted for skin color or, you know, or anything else. This is the opportunity of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And if we don't want planet Earth to be a kind of mirror of planet Venus or of planet Mars, space is a very vast place and it's very, very empty and it's very, very cold. We need to take care of um, what we need to take care of, so to speak, or as Suzuki Roshi used to say, the most important point is to remember what's the most important point. And so I love that wakefulness is evolving, that there is such a thing as mindfulness in America. We could smile at it, but we're not going to laugh at it. This is like really, really, really important. Can it evolve? Can it grow? Can we understand it in deeper and deeper ways? Can we study it in ways that will actually convince people that think meditation is like ridiculous uh, to actually uh, be motivated to actually play with befriending themselves in that way? And then that it manifests in a million different ways. Form is not what this is about. It's, it's about wisdom. Mm-hmm. Well, Does that I make wanna, any sense to you? It makes so much sense. Um, it makes so much sense. It's underneath it all is the, is the wisdom and the beauty that resides in every individual. And, the, and if... If you don't mind, I mean, if it's, it, it's infectious in, in the sense like there was a time that you and I didn't know each other, mm-hmm. okay? And now you relate to me as if like I'm the person that in some sense turned you on to mindfulness, if I can say it that way, okay? Mm-hmm. But now you've been practicing mindfulness for a very long time in corporate settings, in your own private life and everything else. You're as much what this is about as I am. And there are millions of us. It's not like it's the beauty of Indra's net is there's no center. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, we put the Buddha in the center or we put the hero of the moment or Mother Teresa even or, you know, anybody. The beauty is there is no center. That's the way the universe is. People don't recognize that. They don't actually know that there's no center to space. There's no center to the universe. This is a cosmologist saying this. So at best, all we can do is take responsibility for our small corner of it and recognize that we're all teaching each other, that we're all uh, shaping each other, that we're all appreciating each other when we truly see each other and get out of our own way and the sort of screens of the mind or the screens of the eyes that don't actually allow us to see because we see our opinions our likes and dislikes and stuff like that. So in that sense, you know, although the way it's worked out this time is that uh, you're interviewing me, the fact is that, uh, you know, what you said about the dialogue, the question, you know, the, the conversations that were happening is something that has really, um, I'm going to have to spend a lot more time sitting with in a certain way. So that was just one piece of evidence that if I'm your teacher, you're my teacher. Okay. And this is true for all of us. Mm -hmm. When we recognize that, then you, it's not that you're not special, you being any of us, but it's that we're all special, Mm -hmm. really, 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 really special. And that's what you did, John, with your birthday, if I may interrupt you. you sure. Yeah. You, as, as reluctant as you were to turn on your Zoom that day, <laughs> you, you, allowed, you gracefully allowed this community to uh, acknowledge you and thank you and celebrate you, but you also subtly redirected to the, so that the gratitude was to the community and the, and the extension was to the community. Mm. I think if you had deflected too hard, then it, people would have, wanted, would have focused even more on you. But to, to be able to expand... Or it would, have been, it would have been a form of violence in a way because yes. there was so much sincerity in the outpouring. 
there was so much love. So if I reject that, what, what kind of mindfulness or heartfulness would that be? Right, right. And, and yet I, under, I understand the reluctance. And so to be able to use that opportunity for the grat- in, in the Indra's net mindset to use that, to have the gratitude flow in all directions yeah. through the net became, um, you know, a turning point, if you will, for that community and perhaps even enabled you and Soren to make the decision to wind down those sessions in that form, in a sense of having, having seen the strength of the, the love that existed in the community, which of course was not bound by the thousand people or the however many people are on the map of love. It's much broader yeah. than even that. So, um, so your, yeah. I thought you, your skill in that ex, um, reflects your deep belief in that, um, in that there is no center um, and how to, mm-hmm. how to be graceful when you're being put in the center. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, another lesson I'm getting from you right in real time. Um, a deep understanding there of there is no center would really elevate our understanding of what it means to be human. Mm-hmm. And then we would see each other, you know, if you drive by on a highway and you see all these people in cars or in a city or whatever, every, and you're in the middle of your life unfolding, whatever it is, maybe they're kids in the backseat, maybe grandchildren, I don't, every single car has a whole universe of human life unfolding. And you're never going to get to know them, even if they live across the street from you, even if every once in a while you have chocolate cake together or something like that or a backyard barbecue. Getting to really know who people really, really are, really are, it's like, the only way you can do it is to begin to get to know who you really, really are, and then see that you're not gonna know it through thought, who anybody else is. You're gonna know it through feeling them and leaving them a lot of space for like, minding your own business and not knowing because you don't even know what your own business is, or for that matter, 99% of what's going through your own head. So these are all like interesting revelations that frankly, Karen, if we weren't having this conversation, I probably wouldn't have thought about in this quite this way. So again, another example of how inquiry and dialogue and conversation actually um, brings out contrasts and and brings things into focus in ways that are totally unexpected and that we have the potential to learn from. The only other thing that I I would say just to make sure it's explicit is that mindfulness is, um, you know, really based on a a profound ethical foundation. Okay, so it's about Mm non-harming, ahimsa, you know, what Gandhi and, you know, from the Sanskrit ahimsa, non-harming. And how would you even know if you're causing harm unless you're aware? You wouldn't know it. You wouldn't see it in the consequences and the faces of the people that you may have just insulted or threatened or terrified. If you were a doctor, for instance, uh, and, you know, and you just ignore somebody at a moment or whatever it is, you know, we cause harm an awful lot of the time completely unconsciously because we're so self-centered. So this is kind of like the moral foundation of this practice is to be, um, as the U.S. Marine motto is, all you can be. So, although I'm 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 purposefully taking, I guess, a, I mean, of the- a military, you know, <laughs> where there's violence associated with it, <clears throat> but the invitation is to actually be the full dimensionality of who you are. Then it's almost always possible to minimize harm Mm -hmm. and maximize the recognition of beauty, even in people who are very, very different from yourself on this one small planet. So we've covered a lot of territory. I know. We probably need to wrap it up for the benefit of those who might be watching. Yeah, it might get bored. But it's, it's absolutely... Uh, lovely and an honor to spend time with you, John, as always. Right, right back at you, Karen, as they say. Uh, so, so, yeah, deep gratitude to you and, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, 
to do this and and um and you and if we may it be beneficial day, may it be beneficial to all the people who may at some point hear this but i tell you if nobody heard it uh i heard it in a way that uh is going to resonate with me for a long time to come and has been quite uh not just provocative but but illuminating and i hope that's the case for other people yeah. and, and and if that were true okay. then it would be also true that nothing that's gone on between us today is separate from the meditation practice itself mm.